Amen. Well, I want to take this moment to welcome all of you that are here and those of you that are watching online to Venia Church. Venia means grace, and here at Venia, we do share the grace of God by loving people because God accepts us as we are, and he sees the potential of who we can be. Amen? Amen. Amen. God's word truly changes lives, and so this morning we are going to be in the book of Daniel. Uh, We're going to be in chapters 11 and 12, and I want to talk to you uh, this morning about what happens after the 69 weeks of Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy. Uh, There's that last week, the last uh, 70th week, that final seven-year period here on earth, and um, a lot is going to happen in those seven years. Uh, Last week, we we reviewed the 70 weeks prophecy. We looked at the first 69 weeks, and um, we kind of focused in on those 69 weeks as far as when did those begin? We talked about Nehemiah chapter 2, uh, where Artaxerxes gave the command. He, he gave them permission. He gave them supplies. He gave them safe passage to go and rebuild the city Jerusalem. Uh, so we know that was the time that those uh, weeks started, and then it went all the way through until Jesus the Messiah rode in on Palm Sunday, uh, was hailed as king, and um, that was when that ended. Uh, and so if you missed that, go ahead and check it out on venia.tv. Uh, but there was a gap we briefly spoke about last week. There was a gap after the 69 weeks and then before the 70th week starts. Uh, Daniel chapter 9 verse 26 tells us that after the 62 weeks, and so remember there was seven weeks, so seven times seven is 49, gives us the 49 years it took to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. Then you have the 62 weeks after that. Uh, So after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. I think any Christian here this morning or any of you who are watching online know that this is talking about Jesus going to the cross, being cut off, uh, dying on the cross, but not for himself. He did that for who? For us. Uh, Anybody who would call on his name and be saved by what he did for them. And so he shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with the flood until the end of the war. Desolations are determined. Um, And so this is speaking of what took place in A.D. 70. In AD 70, the second temple was destroyed. There was a flood of Roman soldiers that came in. And these Roman soldiers were uh, the people of the prince who is to come. And so when many people talk about the Antichrist, they believe that the Antichrist is going to come from Rome, be an heir to Rome, and this is why. Uh, And so we see that there. And there is this church age that takes place between that time that the Messiah is cut off until the very beginning of those final seven years. What is the church age? Well, it's the age that you and I are now living in. When Jesus went to the cross, he died for you and for me and anybody that calls on his name. Uh, He died, he went into the grave, he rose again three days later, and we know on the day of Pentecost, found in Acts chapter 2, that on that day the church was born. What took place is Jesus sent his Holy Spirit back, the helper that he said his father promised that he would send. Um, And so here comes the Holy Spirit, comes upon the members that believed in Jesus Christ. And what happened that day was very significant. They started speaking in tongues. They started speaking, and what happened was everybody there understood what they were saying. And it didn't matter. They They spoke one thing in one way, but everybody could understand it. The reason that is significant is because before that time, when God spoke to his people, he spoke in Hebrew. And then on that day, as his spirit was poured out and the church was born, now they're speaking and everybody, Jews and Gentiles alike, now understood the message of God. And so that's significant because God says, look, I was dealing with the people of Israel. Now I'm dealing with anybody who will call upon my name. The church is birth. We're in the church age. But there's going to be a time when The church is no longer going to be here on earth, and God is going to now refocus his attention back on Israel, and that 70th week will begin. 
And that 70th week is going to be broken down into two segments, the first three and a half years and the second three and a half years. Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 tells us that he shall confirm a covenant, this is speaking of the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many, or your Bible may see the many. So he'll confirm a covenant with many for one week. That's that 70th week. But in the middle of it, three and a half years into it, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And so, like I said, the the many is the people Israel. Uh, And he's going to make a covenant with them. It's going to be a peace treaty that's going to last supposedly seven years. But halfway through it, he's going to break that treaty, and we'll find that he does what the rest of this says. It says, And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. And so halfway through, he's going to go into the temple that will be rebuilt. He's going to set himself up as God and demand the world worship him as God. And so this 70th week is coming quickly upon the earth. Uh, And there's a question that a lot of people have is, when is this 70th week going to start? What needs to take place for that week to actually begin? Well, we know this. It's going to take a seven-year peace treaty. Somebody has to rise up and say, listen, I've got an idea. Let's have a treaty to bring peace for seven years. Not only does that need to take place, but also the rapture has to take place. Uh, And so the rapture, if you don't know, this is when God is going to come and snatch up his church. How many of you have the Spirit of God filling you right now? Okay, that is who he's coming to get. You are who he's coming to get. Amen. Right? And it says in a twinkling of an eye, he's going to catch us up and we are going to no longer be here on earth. And so when that happens, we're going to see something amazing. But here, here's the deal. and This is the reason I say this is something that needs to happen before the seven weeks can take place. Um, you and I know, because we're reading the Word of God, that there is going to be a person who rises up and they're going to be able to get the world to buy into their leadership that, hey, there's all sorts of turmoil going on in the Middle East. We want peace. Why is there so much fighting? This guy's going to rise up and say, I've got an idea. Let's get seven years of peace. And, and he's going to find a way to do that. And so people are going to go, oh, I like this. That's good. We want peace. And the world, the Bible says that the world's going to buy into his leadership. Now, you and I as believers in knowing God's word, we're not going to buy into that. We have to be gone. We have to be gone. We can't, we can't be here for those things to actually take place. Another thing that's going to happen is the beginning of the building of the temple. The temple has to be rebuilt on the temple mount in order for the Antichrist to set himself up to be worshipped. And so if we start seeing the building of that, we're going to go, hold on a second. This is, this is end times. We're in it. So God's going to remove his church and these things are going to start to take place. But So my point in saying that is the people that are spirit-filled, the people that already have given their life over to the Lord, they're not going to be here. They are not going to be here. And so you might be asking, if I'm not going to be here for that, then why do I need to know about it? That's a valid question. Let's answer that this morning in our message entitled Spirit Filled. And so open your Bibles. We're going to dig right in. Chapter 11 of Daniel. We're going to pick up in verse 36. And you'll find here in verse 36 that there's a shift that took place from verse 35 to 36. We see a major shift because up until verse 35, what you're seeing is uh, Antiochus IV. You've heard that now several times. Antiochus IV is known as the Antichrist of the Old Testament. Uh, And so he was awful, but he was just a foreshadow of the Antichrist of the end times. Now here in verse 36, you're seeing a shift to the end times Antichrist. And so there in verse 36, we're going to see the rise of that person. It says that then the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods, and shall prosper... Keep that word in mind. He shall prosper 
till the wrath has been accomplished for what has been determined shall be done. And so he's not going to show his true colors at first. At first, he's going to seem like a master politician. Like I said, people are going to listen to what he says and they're going to buy in to his leadership. He's going to have ideas that nobody has been able to bring to fruition. Uh, and so in some way, he's going to prosper in that. He's going to have ideas. People are going to buy into it. People are going to do it. And it's going to be apparently successful in what he does. He's going to be able to solve these centuries-old conflict between the Arabs and the Israelis. He's going to be able to find a way for that third temple to be built. And when I say third temple, it's because Solomon, the son of David, built the first temple. That temple was destroyed, and then King Herod came, rebuilt the second temple. And then what we talked about earlier, AD 70, the Roman soldiers flooded in. They destroyed that second temple. And since that time, all that's left is just bedrock. It's just a, a heap of land that people have literally been fighting over for centuries. They've been killing each other over it. And even to this day, it is a source of tension. And so he's going to find a way for that third temple to finally be rebuilt and for sacrifices to start, you know, to begin. They've already, if you go to Israel today or you just go online to the templeinstitute.com, you can see they already have all the instruments. They've been working really hard to get what's called the red heifer. They've got that already set aside so that way they could start the sacrifices. They've got all the priestly robes. They've got the, the ephod. They've got the different washing basins. They've got everything they need. All they need right now is permission. That's all they need. Because currently what's happening, you have the, the mosque there at the Temple Mount. The Palestinians are one, the ones kind of controlling what's happening there on the Temple Mount where the temple of the true God is supposed to be. Uh, and so they believe that that's where the prophet Muhammad was at. But they're controlling it even though it's there on Israeli soil. And so some, at some point, somebody's going to have a way for them to build that temple there and for sacrifices to begin again. Um, last year, September 13th, uh, which is known as Elul 29 on the Hebrew calendar, last year began something very significant. Daily violence there at the Temple Mount. Daily violence there in the Holy City. Uh, it's been getting worse and worse every single day. If you've been watching the news, reading into what's taking place there in Israel, uh, it has not been getting better. It's only been getting worse, and it was very significant that it started there on September 13th of last year. Another significant thing that took place last year, it was in October of last year, is that France did something with the United Nations. What they did is they drafted a UN Security Council presidential statement. And this was to, quote, advance an initiative calling for deployment of international observers to Jerusalem's holy sites, including the Temple Mount. Now, as they did this, this is the reason they say. This was to, quote, Ensure the status quo is maintained and to help quell recent violence which has surrounded the holy sites in Israel. Why is that significant? Here's why. Because what they're, what they're proposing to the UN, what France in October of last year, what they proposed to the UN is that the UN would force their security forces onto the Temple Mount that the United Nations would now take over where the temple of God is supposed to be built, that they would push the Jews aside, and that they would take over security of that. The reason that's so significant is because it's likely that somebody may rise up and say, listen, now that we've got control of this, we have a way to make peace. We can, we can, we can ensure security. We can ensure peace. We can ensure that the Muslims can keep what they have there at the Dome of the Rock. We can ensure that the, the Jews can come over here and build their temple. We can ensure, in fact, we can, we can ensure the security. We can do it for seven years. So the stage is being set for these things to take place. That took place in October of last year after the violence started in September. 
Uh, and so the third temple is at some point going to be rebuilt. It's going to be rebuilt, and halfway through the seven year period, things are going to change drastically. Because in those first three and a half years, it's going to seem like peace. It's going to seem like, well, why didn't we do this a long time ago? They've been fighting over this land. Why didn't we just separate it out? Let the Jews build their thing. Let the Muslim have their thing. Why didn't we do it? It's so peaceful. See, this guy knows what he's doing. And then halfway through, he's going to walk right into the temple of the true living God. He's going to sit on that throne. He's going to say, worship me. I'm God. And all hell is going to break loose here on earth. He's going to prosper though. In those times, he's going to prosper. It's going to appear like he's being very, very successful. Verse 37 of our text this morning, it says that he shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall exalt himself above them all. But, verse 38, in their place he shall honor a God of fortresses and a God which his fathers did not know. He shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and with pleasant things. Thus he shall act against the strongest fortresses with a foreign God which he shall acknowledge and advance its glory and he shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for gain. And so this Antichrist is going to be an atheist. He's going to reject all world religions. He's going to reject everything and establish a religion of his own. Establish a religion where he's the one being worshipped. And notice here it says that he's not going to regard the God of his fathers. And it says he won't regard the desire of women. Now some people, you know, what they think that means is that he's going to be a man that's given over to homosexuality. It's probably not what that means. Uh, what that probably means is if you study uh, the, what the Jewish customs were, the culture of the Jewish people before Jesus was born, the desire of every woman was that the Messiah would be birthed through her. That was the hope. Uh, and so women were actually like watching lineage and they were actually hopeful that someday they would have that privilege that Mary had that they would have the privilege to, to give birth to Jesus the Messiah. And so when this is saying that he's going to reject, um, he won't regard the God of his fathers nor the desire of women, it's saying he's not going to regard Jesus is likely what, what that means here. Uh, so take a quick look, if you would just flip over to chapter 12 and take a look at verse 1. There in chapter 12, verse 1, it says, At that time, meaning during the time of the end, at that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, in other words, the people Israel, and there shall be a time of trouble such as, has, uh, such as never was since, the nation, uh, since there was a nation, even to that time. And at the time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And so this is speaking of those final three and a half years. Uh, the covenant, like I said, will be broken. The, the temple's going to be seized. The Antichrist is going to demand to be worshipped as God. And Jesus told us about this. This isn't just in the book of Daniel. Jesus spoke about this in Matthew 24. He said, the day is coming when you will see what Daniel the prophet spoke about. And so here's Jesus confirming what Daniel, Daniel had already been told. He says, uh, you'll see what the Daniel prophet spoke about, the sacrilegious object that causes desecration, standing in the holy place. And so there he is, standing there, demanding to be worshipped as God. And it says, reader, pay attention. Who is it that he's speaking to there? Us, the ones who read the word of God. Reader, so all of us here this morning, pay close attention. It says, then those in Judea must Flee to the hills. A person out of, on the deck of a roof must not go down into the house to pack. A person out in the field must not return even to get a coat. How terrible it will be for pregnant women and for nursing mothers in those days. And pray, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For there will be greater anguish than at any time since the world began, and it will never be so great again. Those three and a half final years are going to be hell on earth. If you read the book of Revelation, you see all these judgments, the 
trumpets and the bulls and these things, this wrath of God being poured out. And yeah, we talked this morning as I was praying and opening the message, we are so grateful for the grace of God. But listen, there is the wrath of God as well. And it's a righteous wrath. And he's telling us, listen, those three and a half years are going to be hell on earth. If you're pregnant, you're going to be miserable. If you're nursing, it's going to be terrible. And the beautiful thing about all of that is you and I, as we're filled with God's Spirit, don't have to go through it. Amen? Amen. Listen, this, this is a time where you're going to find that this will be very difficult for the Jewish people. Because the Christians are not going to be there. God will have called his church up, and he will now, like I said, turn his attention in those final seven years to the nation of Israel. And it says that that great prince, Michael the angel, will come to their aid. And so Revelation 7 tells us that there's going to be 12,000 people from each of the 12 tribes. It's going to be 144,000 that's a remnant that God is going to use in that time. And so God is going to fulfill his promise to the Jewish people. They are going to enter in to their promised land. And so, real quick, turn back with me to, to chapter 11 and look at verse 40. So, of course, as the Antichrist sets himself up to be worshipped, not everyone's going to want to do that. I mean, God, who loves them, has been requesting people worship him for millennia. And not everyone worshiped a God that loves them. The Antichrist isn't going to love them. He's going to be cruel and he's going to demand worship. Not everybody's going to want to do it. First of all, you're going to have the Jews there. They're not going to want to worship the Antichrist. You're going to have new converts because let's face it, as much as we speak out about the truth about God's word, when the rapture happens and then those final seven years begin, there's going to be some people who remember the messages we've given them, those warnings that we told them about, and they're going to believe. There will be people that give their life over to Christ during those seven years, and so those people are going to say, no, forget about it. I'm not worshiping the Antichrist. There's also going to be people from other religions in the world. Hindus are going to say, look, i got a list of 10,000 gods, and you aren't on that list. So they're not going to want to do it. Uh, and then there's going to be just the proclaimed atheists, the people who have always rejected any sense of a deity. They go, look, I likes me some me. I'm all about me. I don't want to worship a God. I'm not giving anything over to a God. And so you're not my God. I'm, I'm going to worship me. And so I reject having to worship you. I've always rejected having to worship anything but myself. And so those people aren't going to want to worship the Antichrist. And so in that time, you're going to find that people on earth are going to wage war against the Antichrist. Notice in verse 40 that at that time the, of the end, the king of the south shall attack him. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. He, in verse 41, shall enter the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape from his hand, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall follow at his hills. And so as we read that, you know, you're hearing the north, the south, the east, you know, you're hearing these things. Uh, in the previous prophecies in Daniel, it talks about the north and the south, the north uh, being Syria, the south being Egypt. That may not be the case in the end times. Many people think that in the end times, the north is going to be headed up by Russia and the south will be headed up by Egypt. But regardless of who it is, they're not going to win. Regardless of who it is, like we said earlier, the Antichrist is going to prosper in those times. They're not going to be able to defeat him. He's going to overthrow them. He's going to gain power. He's going to gain wealth, and he's going to prosper in that time. But there is going to be one battle, and you have heard of this battle, I'm sure. It's a major battle that takes place. Uh, it's called the Battle of Armageddon. Now, this battle is not just a really cool movie theme. 
Okay, I know there's lots of movies made. You've heard about Armageddon, and we launch spaceships into the, to the atmosphere, and we're out there putting nuclear bombs to try to redirect asteroids, and there's all sorts of ideas. There's even uh, a new TV show out, You, Me, and the Apocalypse, you know, that, that try to talk about what the, the Armageddon is going to be like. It's not going to be like what they're thinking, okay? Um, it's not just a cool movie concept. It's a true battle that's going to take place. It's spoken of in the book of Revelation. It's spoken of in Joel and Zechariah, and it's spoken of here in verse 44. It says, news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many, and he shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. And so today, if you go to Israel, you can go to a place called Tel Megiddo. Uh, Tel is just a place where you have a mountain. And what happens is they would you know, build a city, and then somebody would come and destroy it. And so they just dump everything down, start over again. They start to build on top of that. Then somebody comes and destroys it. They, that crumbles, and then they build on top of that. And after a while, uh, in this great valley, you'll see these these mountains, well, they're not mountains. They're just destroyed cities that they kept building on top of. Those are called tells. And so Tel Megiddo, there in the valley of Megiddo, um, there is where you can look over the valley of Megiddo and you can see where the battle of Armageddon is going to take place. You can watch it and you can see where exactly where these armies are going to come in and the battle is going to be waged. Uh, and so there in Megiddo, there's this huge army that comes from the east. It's positioned to attack the forces of the Antichrist. And then the verse continues by saying, Yet he shall come to his end. No one will help him. He's not going to prosper forever. He is going to come to his end. The Lord will return. The Lord's going to defeat the armies that come against the Antichrist and defeat the Antichrist. He's going to take Satan, he's going to take the Antichrist and the false prophet captive, he's going to cast him into the lake of the fire, and Jesus Christ is going to set up the millennial kingdom. Amen? Amen. That Antichrist is not going to prosper, even though it's going to be terrible for years, even though all these battles are going to be fought, Jesus is going to come, he's going to set up that millennial kingdom. And verse 2 of chapter 12, if you take a look at that, verse 2 tells us, that many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, hooray for them, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And so those who were born twice, they were born here on this earth and then they were born again of the Spirit. Those who were born twice are Spirit-filled those who are born twice get everlasting life. They get to spend eternity with Christ in heaven. They never have to feel pain again. They never have to feel shame again. They never have to cry. They're going to be in the presence of the Lord. I'm speaking of people like you and me who have given our lives over to Jesus and are now spirit-filled. They're going to enter into that beauty of the Lord, but some, not so much. Some, it says, are going to enter into shame and everlasting contempt. Those are people who were born once but die twice. They die twice into shame and everlasting contempt. But there's something special that takes place for those who go through the tribulation. They go through it and they're true to God. They go through it and they submit their lives over to God. Verse 3 says that those who are wise... Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. When it says turn those to righteousness, what is it talking about? Turning those to Jesus. In other words, people that are wise, they live the way God wants them to live, and people who point other people to Jesus to the truth about who God is. During the tribulation, there are going to be people who live wise and turn people to God. And God says it's something special. They're, they're going to shine in that time. And I think it's very appropriate for us to understand something that God says two things there. One of them, he says first, those who live wise. 
Because you can't turn people to God. You can't go to them and say, you need to live for God. You need to know God. You need to submit to the Lord Jesus. You can't do that if you yourself are not doing that. You can't. It, it, there, nobody's going to buy into it. God wants you and I to be living wisely. As we go through our life, we've got to determine, is what I'm about to do wise? Is it knowing what God wants me to do and I'm carrying that out in my life? Or am I living foolishly? Am I being the husband that God's called me to be? Am I being the spouse, the wife that God wants me to be? Am I parenting my children properly? Am I spending my money the way God wants me to spend it? Am I spending my time the way God wants Am I just sitting around and watching TV all day? Or am I actually digging into God's word? Out fellowshipping with other people. How am I living? Am I living wisely? And if you can find yourself living wisely, you will find yourself pointing people to righteousness. Now, this is talking about people who go through the tribulation. People that, that have to go through that terrible time, that hell on earth. Now, remember, you and I don't have to go through those seven years. The rapture is going to happen, and we're not going to be here. Now, a beautiful thing about that is your mother doesn't have to be through going through those seven years. Your children don't have to go through. Your neighbor doesn't have to go through. God gives everyone a choice. And we have something beautiful right now. We have an opportunity right now to live wisely and point people to Jesus. So that way they don't have to go through it either. We don't want anybody. If, if we start thinking about our life and going, okay, how is my relationship with God? Well, I, I love God so much, and I want to be like God. He says, be holy. Why? Because he's holy. Have your life set apart for him because it's what we're supposed to do. And so if we're going to have the heart of God, God wishes that no one would perish. He's screaming out, I want you to love me. I want a relationship with you. And so we ought to take this time now knowing that these seven years could start at any moment. We should take this time now to share this good news with everyone. But we have to live wise first. We have to have our lives right. We've got to be doing things the way God wants us to do it. It's important. Listen, these seven years could start at any moment. There's a beautiful story that Jesus teaches us in Matthew. He's, he's telling us about ten virgins. And these ten virgins have oil. And it's a Jewish custom, really. What, what would happen is when a man and a woman were going to get married, the woman would have ten bridesmaids, and they would have these vessels with oil. And they would be waiting until the, the groom showed up. And then when the groom would show up, they would go out at night with their lamps lit, and they would help usher in the groom to the bride. It was a beautiful procession that the bride and the groom would, would then be joined together. So in that time, they would be waiting for the groom to show up, and they would have to have their vessels full of oil, so that way they'd be prepared. And Jesus said that, that at, at any moment that, that groom would show up, and in this case, in this story he's telling us, which is a parable, it's just an earthly story, but it gives a heavenly meaning. In that moment, five of them had their vessels full. The other five were empty. And so in that, that moment, there's, you can imagine there's this scramble like, oh my gosh, he's here. What do we do? Can I have some of your oil? And the Bible says that, that the ones that were wise said, go get your own. Look, we have the oil we were wise. We were prepared. Go and see if you can find some. And so they rush out and they're like scrambling all over. Where do I get some? Do you have any? And they're, they're just trying desperately because they're in a panic. They're trying desperately to find this oil. Well, in the meantime, the, the groom comes in and just goes in with the five. The ones that were wise. And shuts the door. And these ones that were foolish come and they're knocking on the door. They're like, let me, let me in, let me in. And he says, look, I... I don't even know you. It's very traumatic in that moment. You think about these, these people that want in so bad. They don't want to be left out. And the groom says, look, I don't even know you. At the end of the parable, Jesus says this in Matthew 25. He says, watch. 
Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. What does he say? Watch. Be prepared. Have your eyes looking out. Look around. See what's happening. You don't know when this is going to happen. It could happen at any moment. It's imperative. We can't just go around life and just ignore it. We can't go around with our eyes focused on all these other things. He says, look, watch. It can happen at any moment. You won't know the day or the hour. Now listen, we're not going to know the day. He's already told us that. We're not going to know the hour. We know this. But we can know the season. We can know the signs of the times in which we're living. I told you about September 13th of last year. That was Elul 29 on the Jewish calendar. Now that began something very significant. That began what's called a prophetic jubilee. A year of jubilee. Now you go back a couple of jubilees. A jubilee is a year of a period of 50 years. You go back to 1917. What took place was the Balfour Declaration. That was a year of jubilee preceded by war. And what happened was the Jewish people then, in a fulfillment of God's prophecy, the Jewish people came back to Israel. They came back from all different areas of the earth and started to occupy the Holy Land again. You fast forward to the next jubilee, 1967. What took place? The Six-Day War. Again, war preceded by a restoration for the people of Israel. What, what happened? So they, they're coming from the earth, all over the earth, back to the Holy Land. There in 1967, what happened? They, they're in the Holy Land. Now they recaptured Jerusalem. Fast forward to the next Jubilee, which started last September 13th, Elul 29. What happened then? We started seeing violence erupting on the Temple Mount. We started seeing the UN saying, okay, maybe we should take over there and find a way for peace. We're seeing these things take place before our very eyes. God said, watch. Don't be ignorant of it. Have your eyes open and watch. We watch so much stuff in our lives. My guess is today we're going to watch the Super Bowl. Just just a, a guess. We watch so many things. I'm not saying it's wrong to watch the Super Bowl. I'm going to watch the Super Bowl. I'm not saying it's wrong. What I'm saying, though, is in all the things that we watch, I think it's a good idea that we watch what's taking place on earth. We listen to what God has said in his word, and we just look at what's taking place, and we see that the end is approaching. It could happen at any moment. We can't ignore this. And the the whole thing that I want us to understand today is that as we are filled with God's Spirit, we don't have to go through it. And if we have the heart of God, we shouldn't want anyone else to go through it. You know, when, when it's talking about the ones who had oil and those who didn't, oil, you know, is significant. It speaks of God's Holy Spirit. The ones who were filled with oil, they were filled with the presence of God. They were marked by God. In that moment, that's the differentiating factor. Who has God's spirit and who doesn't? Who is spirit-filled and who isn't? Now, a lot of people go, "I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm filled with God's spirit. How do I know? Well, let me just tell you, there's a real easy way to start examining your own life. God says that when you walk in His Spirit, when you're filled with His Spirit, something takes place. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. It's what happens naturally as you have God's Spirit in you, and it's this. It's love. It's joy. It's peace. It's kindness. It's patience. It's gentleness. It's self-control. Those are what happens as you're filled with God's Spirit. It's fruit. It just naturally takes place. And so if you're wondering, are you filled with God's Spirit? Look at your life. Are those things that mark your life? Have you found that, that over the course of time, those things have become more a part of who you are? That before you, con- you know, believed in your heart and you confessed with your mouth, before that you really, really weren't that loving? You had no self-control? 
You weren't kind to people. You weren't patient. You'd lose your temper real easily. But ever since you believed in your heart and you confessed with your mouth, now all of a sudden that kindness, that patience, the gentleness, the self-control, those are increasing in your life. As time goes by, you're seeing that that is what marks who you are. Then I would say you are filled with God's Spirit. There's a lot of people who confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, but they don't believe it in their heart. What a sad day it will be when the Lord returns for his church, for those people. What a sad day. We don't want that for anyone. God wants us to be spirit-filled. Let's pray for that right now.